Hi everyone, thanks for making the left turn. For today, Saturday, November 25th, 2017, I'm George Ferrer and welcome back to the Jack's Left channel. Welcome back to another episode of History Jacksonville. As promised, I'm here at the Timucuan Preserve at Kingsley Plantation, just off the Fort George River on Fort George Island. I have so much to bring you and so much to talk with you about, and a lot of what I'm gonna talk with you about today is of a very serious nature. It's going to be about the old economy, the plantation economy, some would call it the slave economy. It all begins with, at least so far as Fort George Island and Jacksonville is concerned, and the economy that developed on this island, it started, really got to going in 1798 with the construction of this plantation house by the slaves of a man named John McQueen. And I'm gonna talk with you uh, extensively about Mr. Kingsley. And I'm gonna talk with you about Mr. Kingsley's plantation, uh, the way he did business, how he got involved in Florida territorial politics. Because remember, before Florida could become a state, it became a territory. and. Uh, Mr. Kingsley was involved in the Florida Territorial Council. And so I'll talk with you about that. I'll talk with you about the economy going on. I'll talk with you at that time. I'll talk with you about the slaves. I'll talk with you about the slave quarters. And I'll give you my feelings and my thoughts about Mr. Kingsley, who was an incredibly, um, one might say, a complex individual. Uh, I think he was amidst changing times. He had a number of plantations, and uh, he was quite hands-on in slave trading. Uh, he didn't let some middleman handle his slaves. He would go and pick them up himself. But he had, uh, growing up in Charleston, South Carolina, a British colony back then, uh, he was quite familiar with slave trading. He grew, you could say he grew into it. And so finally he got his plantation system going, and I'll talk with you about that. And ultimately, he came here. Uh, there was a bad fire on, on this plantation uh, in 1813, and so he came along a couple years later, and you could say perched it on a fire sale. The house had survived, but the area around had caught fire and burned. Uh, we're going to talk about the complexities. We're going to talk about the the human nature of the economy back then. Um, you know, these were different times. This was way before the Civil War, the Emancipation Proclamation, Reconstruction, ultimately later on, civil rights uh, for African Americans. Uh, there's a lot that I have to bring you. And in some ways, it's with heavy heart. Um, I've only encountered uh, slave cabins only a couple times in my travels, looking at historical uh, uh, sites. Uh, at one point, I went off to see Monticello, uh, and uh, to, that was the estate of our third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. I was going to stay for the garden tour, but once I 
walked past the slave quarters, I cut the tour short and hustled back to the parking lot. Uh, you know, as a white man, I have my feelings. I've grown into, of course, we know the latter half of the 20th century, uh, going right into the 21st century. There are a lot of problems in this country, but when I look at the old days, you could say, back in the early 19th century, you have to look at how people survived. Not just how they made money, but how they survived, how they lived, and how they persevered. I uh, hope that you enjoy what I have to bring you. Uh, this is a, um, something that's incredibly different for me, and so I'll do the best that I can to communicate it with you here on History Jacksonville. I've got a lot planned ahead, and it's time for me to say it. I've got a lot of uh, talking about what's going to happen. I have some illustrations. I have some insights. Let's roll it. Let's begin by taking a look at the 1878 illustration of the Kingsley Mansion and November 25th, 2017 of the Kingsley Mansion, otherwise known as the Plantation House. And we'll take a look, look at those beautiful palm trees on such a beautiful morning on Fort George Island. And we see here the river side of the house. In a moment, you'll see the Fort George River. Uh, very beautiful. Uh, there would have been a lot of activity back then. And we see here a boat going down the river. A lot of boat traffic still today. And you can only imagine that there was a lot of boat traffic bringing in goods, taking away goods, uh, because the river was a primary source of transportation for people and things. So as we uh, take a look uh, further out, uh, it's beautiful uh, bay windows. And uh, it's going to be a great presentation for you. On the Zephaniah Kingsley Plantation, they grew mostly Sea Island cotton. That was the cash crop. They also grew citrus, harvested sugarcane, and corn. He owned four plantations, totaling approximately 200 slaves. So he had a lot of things going on. He had slaves who had tasks that had to be completed each day. After the tasks that they were assigned were completed, they could then go and harvest their own crops to feed for themselves, do whatever hunting and fishing they needed to do. And we'll talk now about the slave, the remnants of the slave cabins. These cabins were constructed of tabby, which is a fast drying concrete of the time, composed of um, uh, lime shells, uh, shells, um, gravel, and stones, all mixed together. So uh, we're taking a look at a picture uh, talking about uh, the uh, slave cabins uh, made out of tabby brook. Uh, it says here he taught the prisoners to speak English and after training them to perform useful tasks, he made a large profit by selling them as slaves. So there was slave trading. There was a buying and selling of people for their labor. Now he had as his first plantation, Laurel Grove, out in what we now know as Orange Park. Okay, this document here is a totaling, it looks like, of his acreage. Uh, it looks like we have the year 1825. Okay, so uh, this looks like he's, some of his business uh, of report, uh, rec it looks like it's a recommended for confirmation by commissioners. So, uh, they at that time were, you know, it really was a pen and paper society, okay? Uh, and he had special claims on land, okay? Uh, and so we're taking a look at what the slave quarters looked like, uh, and we're going to talk about uh, the life of, of slaves on the plantation. We'll take a look inside uh, a slave cabin. Uh, one thing to point out was that he married a woman named Anna Medyanzi 
from West Africa. It wasn't a formal marriage ceremony, but but they were they were man and wife, okay, husband and wife. Uh, he bought her, okay. He bought her as a slave. Then he freed her. Then he made her his wife. And she ultimately would have her own slaves, and she would have her own land, eventually out in Mandarin. Okay, so this was a mixed race family situation in the early 19th century in North Florida on Fort George Island. Now, this was a somewhat remote um, area, it, even today. You know, you're not going to necessarily be able to stop off for McDonald's a mile down the road out this way. Okay. Uh, unique area. If you really ever check out, uh, you go out and check out uh, northern Duval County. So we're now taking a look uh, at a what would have been a typical slave cabin. We notice the campfire here at the front, okay? No harnessing of electricity, okay? No ovens uh, that we know of as electric ovens and things like that. So there was a lot of cooking over the fire. Uh, and so this is where uh, they lived in a semicircle, uh, not far, a very, very short walk from the plantation house. Uh, each of these cabins out in the semicircle. And if you think about it, you know, you would have all these people coming and going uh, at the beginning and at lunchtime, at the end of the day. Uh, and then at night, you know, settling down, okay? We're out in the middle of, of the woods and uh, a lot of insects, okay? If for those of you who decide to visit, who decide to visit the Kingsley Plantation, no matter what time of year, uh, bring insect repellent, uh, particularly along the river. So it, can you imagine all these people gathering? They all had their own, it was a, a little neighborhood you could say, but people were, and, and he was more considered more of a liberal, uh, a more of a liberal uh, slave owner than others. He would allow his slaves to hunt and fish, uh, be able to travel around the general area, but they were still restricted to the fact that they really couldn't leave. Okay, they were bound to the land, bound to the labor with which they were trained. These people just couldn't get up and move completely away. And they lived their lives. There were slaves that were born and died and uh, had to deal with the trivialities of life. Uh, they entertained themselves. Uh, amused themselves. They, um, though, were still faced with the grim uh, realities of trying to survive uh, in uh, the world in which they were born and the conditions which, with which they ran into. So uh, there was a harshness uh, to the environment, but of course people back then were somewhat accustomed to it you know, back then, no air conditioning. Uh, you know, a lot of the things we think about as modern conveniences were just not available to these people. And also, too, you think of medical care, treatment, health. So there was a lot of struggle. And what advancement would really occur under the plantation system for a typical slave? You were trained in what the interests of the master were, okay? What we're talking is the master plantation economy. Uh, your, your lot in life was determined by the master that purchased you. Now, there was a tremendous amount of goodwill that came from Mr. Kingsley. Uh, so, you know, if you think about it, these times in the 19th century, times were changing. And 
so when these times were changing politically, uh, when it came to uh, Florida, uh, he uh, started to become more increasingly involved because Florida, in the time of his plantation here you know, on Fort George Island, was becoming uh, a territory of the United States of America. And so he uh, was ultimately uh, appointed uh, to the uh, Florida Territorial Council, and uh, which they would have a role uh, in uh, the future of how slaves uh, would be treated within the territory. And he argued for a three-tier system, uh, a three-tier system that he was familiar with back when the Spanish ran things in Florida. Uh, it was a system of uh, free whites, freed blacks, or free blacks, depending upon what was happening with, with some black people, some African Americans, and then slaves. Uh, ultimately, though, the Florida Territorial Council uh, decided that that was not going to happen that there would not be uh, a tolerance of free African Americans. So he decided to resign the Florida Territorial Council. So if you look at it this way, you can see through his action that he definitely uh, was principled about having a society where there were free blacks and free African, you know, free African Americans uh, that were able to, to, to be in society. But he still, though, as a slave trader and as a person who, uh, who profited off the labor, off of the backs of his slaves, he was not going to let slavery itself go. Uh, but ultimately, in 1837, he would construct a plantation down in Haiti, uh, the nation of Haiti, uh, and he would send freed slaves there. Uh, and slaves uh, from this plantation would have the option after his death to go to Haiti. Uh, so uh, if we think about it, when he uh, went down to Haiti and he set up this plantation, uh, it was something he was proud of, and, and I'll go ahead and just um, read to you just a, a brief passage uh, of a question, an, his answer to a question he was given. Uh, he was asked, uh, since he was a slave trader, he was asked this by a, an abolitionist, a person who was against slaves. That was the person who was asking the question. Uh, she was named Lydia Child, and she asked him, uh, was being a slave trader like being a pirate? And he said, quote, yes, and I'm glad of it. They will look upon a slaveholder just so by and by. Slave trading was a very respectable business when I was young. The first merchants in England and America were engaged in it. Some people hide things which they think other people don't like. I never conceal anything. So there was certainly an honesty uh, and an understanding on his part that times were changing. It was how he began his businesses and how he thrived and how he succeeded. But with his profits, with his profits, he was able to create a better life later on, uh, not only for his wife uh, and her family and the freed slaves and the existing slaves, that were in the plantation as he was beginning to realize his own mortality. Okay, he died in 1843. And ultimately, it took the judicial system of what would have been most likely the new state of Florida, because Florida became a state in 1845. It took a while to wind its way through the judiciary. I can only imagine how slow it was back then. Uh, but uh, ultimately, the judiciary decided that they were going to um, uphold the inheritance rights 
of uh, the, uh, the inheritance rights of his wife uh, and of the rights of the, uh, of the, uh, the freed slaves to be able to travel to Haiti uh, to be able to get on with their lives. So it was something very unique. It's a very unique, a unique story. And just uh, to let you know, uh, the National Park Service has been uh, operating this plantation uh, since 1991. Before that, uh, starting in 1955 until 1991, uh, it was run by the Florida Park Service. Uh, it is out on a very substantially uh, remote area uh, of northern Duval County. So I definitely encourage you, when you can, uh, to check it out. To get there, I went on to Hextra Drive, and then I got on this two-mile dirt road. A two-mile dirt road I drove down uh, to bring you this story today. It was the road less traveled. So definitely keep it in mind uh, if you're thinking about uh, going out to the plantation. It was a very peaceful, uh, relaxing drive that, that really does take you out into a different world. And it reminds you how vast Duval County is, how vast Jacksonville is, and what a unique, special place we have right here in North Florida. Uh, so uh, it has been a great pleasure for me to bring to you this episode of History Jacksonville today. As I like to say at the end, I always like to say it, the best is yet to come ahead in December 2017. I'm going to be in downtown Jacksonville taking a look at some historical restorations. Some great things are going on downtown. I'm also going to talk with you about the Greyhound bus station as we prepare for a new Greyhound bus station in another location. So there's a lot going on. I'm also going to talk with you about the Great Fire of 1901 and ultimately most likely turning into the new year in 2018 I'll be talking about our Main Street Bridge so thanks again for watching let me know what you think please share this presentation this this episode of History Jacksonville uh, I am excited about what's ahead and it can only get better from here thanks for watching take it easy see you later Thank you.